this section, we're going to be talking about oligosaccharides. So after watching this video, you should be able to correctly name or draw oligosaccharides depending on what's given to you. You should also be able to identify reducing and non-reducing sugars. So the first off, it's going to be important to interconvert Fisher projections shown here on the left with Hayworth projections shown here on the right in order to name oligosaccharides. Because oligosaccharides are more than one monomer of carbohydrates. So we've only talked about monomers up to this point. This is one monomer, here's another, here's another. This is the linear form and these are the cyclic forms. If you compare the chemical formulas, all of these are identical. If you compare the stereochemistry, all of these are identical. Because remember to interconvert um, the Fisher projections to Hayworth is quite easy. In this instance, we can follow the carbons because this carbon, CH2OH, is right here. This is the only C with two H's on it. So this is 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. That makes this C1 is the special anomeric carbon because in this nucleophilic tack of the hydroxyl on C5 to C1, which is the electrophile, this carbonyl becomes a hydroxyl and it can either point down, which is the alpha form, or it can point up, which is the beta form. But either way, it's going to be important uh, to be able to look at this and see this, or look at Fisher projections and see Hayworth projections. Okay. So the most important carbons that we're going to worry about are carbons 1 and carbon 6 because that's what's going to help us identify um, where, where the rest of these carbons are. Okay. And remember in Fisher projections anything to the right ends up pointing down. So at C2 the hydroxyl groups point to the right so it ends up pointing down. C3 is pointing to the left so it points up. So that's how the stereochemistry works here. So reducing and non-reducing sugars, now's a good point, time to address that. The reducing sugars would be those sugars that can still enter this linear form because this carbonyl can be reduced. So that's what makes it a reducing sugar. So as long as there is nothing attached to this anomeric carbon, this form, this circular form, could actually go back and open up. These are at equilibrium. So there's some percentage that is in the cyclic form and some percentage that's in the linear form. So this would be a reducing sugar because it's still able to ring open and expose that aldehyde. Okay. Additionally, we can draw the same structure. This is actually glucose. And if you look, this is pointing to the right. So this would be D-glucose, just as above. We can point the, uh, even if these structures are drawn in a different way, we can still identify C6 as the elbow and work backwards from there. Five, four, three, six, oh, oops, I numbered that wrong. That's my mistake. Six, this is five, four, three, two and one, five, four, three, two and one, and we can see the anomeric carbons now, but don't forget that the correct way to look at up or down is when the structure looks like this, with the oxygen up, right? So it's relative to the oxygen. So in this projection, instead of, uh, this looks like it's pointing down, but this is actually pointing up, so this would be the beta D-glucose. This is pointing up, but it's actually pointing down relative to the oxygen, so this is the alpha D-glucose. So keep that in mind. You might want to go get your, um, your chemical models that you had to purchase in organic chemistry and pull those out so that you can flip these molecules and really see what's going on. Okay, now into the nitty-gritty we're going to start with a very simple oligosaccharide, maltose. So maltose is made from two glucose monomers, and you can see here the glycosidic bonds. So the glycosidic bonds are formed between two hydroxyl groups, and you can guess what molecule would be released. So this is 
you can think of it as an ether bond because it is, but because it's between carbohydrates, we call it a glycosidic bond. So this is actually a very, very strong bond if you think about the Williamson ether synthesis that is essentially irreversible. So this bond, once it's formed, pretty much will not go backwards. And that's why if the anomeric carbon has a glycosidic bond in it, it can no longer ring open. Okay, so these are both glucose mon monomers. So take a minute and try to find the anomeric carbon. Okay, so the anomeric carbon would be here, based on the position of the C6 carbon here. So six, five, four, three, two, one. Anomeric carbon. This is the C1 carbon. Okay. So, if the anomeric carbon is attached to a glycosidic bond, that is the non-reducing. If the anomeric carbon does not have a glycosidic bond, this is reducing. This particular sugar could actually ring open and become the, and the aldehyde would be exposed again. So that's what makes it um, reducing. Okay, so that's pretty much all the skills we need. Now we're going to go into the rules of how we write the structure. So you have to keep in mind what the individual monomers are. And so that's really a stereochemistry question. We're also going to keep in mind the carbons that are used to make this glycosidic bond. We're going to keep in mind the stereochemistry of each monomer and whether that's alpha or beta. Additionally, if the monomers are different types of residues, here it's a bad example because they're both glucose, D-glucose, but if you have different monomers, it really, really matters what order you put it in. So the order that you would put it in is you put the non-reducing end first. So this is, the, the way I've drawn this is a good example because it shows the non-reducing end on the left. So it would go on the left when you're writing it out. So if these were different, this one would still be on the left. Okay, so the anomeric and enantiomeric forms are prefixes. So remember, the anomeric would be the alpha or beta form, and the enantiomeric refers to whether these are D or L. So let's take a minute and look at this. We already know that this is D, because that was given to you. You should be able to look at this structure in the Hayworth projection and tell me whether or not it's alpha or beta, again, by looking at the anomeric carbon. This points down, therefore, this is alpha D -glu glucose. At this anomeric carbon, this hydroxyl group also points down, so again, this is alpha D glucose. So we know that these are alpha, we know that these are D, and we know that that's going to be a prefix in front of the, what the monomers actually are, which is glucose. The ring configuration is mentioned in the book. But this is really optional. So if um, it's different than what it's typically seen as, so six carbon sugars are typically seen in six-membered rings. If it's a five-membered ring or a seven-membered ring, which would pretty much not happen, you would make a note of that. So if it's in the furanose form, furanose, you would write F if it was unexpected. If it's in the pyranose form, you would write P if that's unexpected. And remember, fur furanose is the furious five, and pyranose means six. Okay, and then finally, we need to identify the atoms between the bond. And so that's exactly like what we did above, keeping in mind that C1 would be the anomeric proton, or the anomeric carbon, rather, CH2OH. Okay, so this would be 1 through 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Okay, so now we see that the linkage occurs between C1 on the first, the non-reducing sugar, and C4 on the second sugar. So this is a 1-4 linkage. 
Okay, so the only thing left to do is write out what's actually going on here. So we have alpha D glucopyranosyl, if you want to be specific, because this explains that this is in the pyranose form. Oh, pyranosyl. Spelling is challenging. Then the linkage. So this is connected at carbon 1, and it's connected to carbon 4 of the second chain of the same alpha D glucopyranosyl. I'm not writing that out again. Or alpha D GLC 1 4 alpha D GLC. So each sugar has its own three letter abbreviation that we can go over during class. Other than that, that's it. So we see the anomeric and enantiomeric prefixes. We see the individual monomers starting with non-reducing, going to reducing, the, and the linkage in between. And this is how you would write it.